Hey there, fellow lost children. I am Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And on today's Web DM, we're going to take a look inside Wild Beyond the Witchlight, because if I'm ever going to find my shadow, it's going to be there. So let's get to it on today's episode. This episode is brought to you by Monty Cook Games and their upcoming 5e book, Plane Breaker, a new supplement for planar adventuring. This is a big deal. You could say that Monty and the other designers at MCG wrote the book on Planescape when they worked on D&D during 2nd and 3rd edition. Actually, they worked on a whole bunch of them. And now they're writing a new book with brand new planes, monsters, and player options as the Plane Breaker traverses the multiverse. Don't miss this one folks the kickstarter begins soon thousands of people are already following the project so join them here link in the comments and description too all right jim mm -hmm. let's get wild with this shit now uh let's do it. <laughs> it's uh it's it's wild beyond the witch light it's the yeah. it's the new hotness from D D. yes um for real and uh i'll have to say just quick first hot take I kind of like what I see. Yeah, yeah. There's, it's refreshing. There's a lot it's of a refreshing change. Yeah, there's a lot of upside on this one. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, first off, why don't you walk us through, uh, uh, first off, your first impressions and uh, just kind of a basic outline. Uh, we're going to try to not be too spoilery for our yeah, fans out yeah. there so that they can hopefully still enjoy. But, you know, you oh, know what sure. to expect from our uh, adventure reviews. Yeah, yeah, for real, yeah. I mean, also, like, there, this is our first impressions. Haven't run it. Haven't done like a super deep dive through the whole book. Um, yeah, so, yeah. in many ways, uh, can't spoiler because <laughs> I'll say for one, my first impression of it is that it is information dense. That like they've really gone through the trouble of making the secrets worth ferreting out, making sure that the NPCs are fleshed out there are a lot of them <laughs> like a lot yeah uh, and they well, a significant portion of, of that uh of those npcs are like relevant in some way or fashion either through a quest or information they have uh something so like when they set out to make an adventure that like you can complete you can you can resolve the challenges put forth in it and the conflicts uh, non-violently without using combat like this is what it looks like <laughs> you know it's there's a lot going on it's about getting leverage over npcs and about like gaining access to npcs and what favors you can trade with uh with those npcs and so in that that sense the whole adventure is laid out to support that you can think of it like a social sandbox right the players are free to explore this fairy realm in never whatever way they see fit um the dm is encouraged to uh, either let them do that or follow a preset path that they've provided, but it's not necessary to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you can just like let the players explore. And so like, this is the kind of game where you want to have a, uh, you know, a really strong motivator uh, for the group. So a session zero is highly recommended um, because the first part of it is like this carnival that you're going to and why you're there and what you're looking for and how that leads to the rest of the adventure is really tied into those initial hooks. And then you go through the carnival, which is really kind of cool. <laughs> it's like, if you're going to do a carnival, like this has got everything you need for it. Um, and then from there on to the larger fairy realm, which is split into three. And you make your way through those three realms, um, doing favors, gathering whatever it is uh, that, that uh, helps you towards your goal. Um, and then we'll discover a larger conflict at play that you can choose to become involved with or not. And mm -hmm. I think like, because it's so open-ended in terms of how you approach it and how the group, um, you know, navigates their way through these things, you could end up with something that's anticlimactic because you've kind of resolved everything and there's not really any tension anymore, uh, in it. And, but it didn't come with like this huge throwdown at the end. Um, and in that yeah. sense... Yeah, I like that. <laughs> That's kind of well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, you you could technically have a sort of a happily ever after in a way. It's a fairy uh, tale. Yeah, yeah, it's a fairy tale, right? <laughs> like that should be an option. It's in all the books. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It it's a it's a vista into what D and D can be. Like, is it the is this is the you know the sort of the fiction of this adventure, the narrative events of it? Does it 
perfectly matched to the D&D rule set? Probably not, but that's okay because the D&D rule set is flexible. It can do a lot of different things. This adventure highlights that and provides a template uh, for other DMs to like read this and be inspired for their own sort of like social adventures. And um, it's, it's kind of cool to see it uh, in action. Uh, most definitely. So you mentioned that uh, as you start at this at this carnival, you're, you're probably going to want to do a session zero to, to see how uh, explicitly your players kind of tie into the, the scenario because it, it is very yeah. important. Um, yeah. So let's yeah. go through some of those player options. I will say there's not a lot. Uh, I, 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 I feel that in other offerings, there have been more options. I mean, there's only like two backgrounds and two races. Mm-hmm. And then that's mm-hmm. that's kind of it. And then the ways that they hook you into the adventure, which there's a couple of yeah. paths that DMs can take. But uh, let's let's walk through those uh, those player options. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's really here that that. Um you know, the fact that this is an adventure book and not like one of those pseudo campaign settings or not even pseudo campaign settings, but like something like Eberron or, or uh, mm-hmm. Wild Mount. It's not one of those. And so the player options are fairly light, but thematic. Um, you know, backgrounds, background wise, you have the Fey Lost, uh, which is sort of like you were in, in the fairy realm at some point or specifically this carnival, something was taken. You just have a connection to it, but you're now in the material plane. And, uh, and and live a sort of like a normal uh, commoner life or whatever, uh, as you, you know, yep. so that um, you don't already very, know a lot about the Feywild as you're going into it, right? Yeah, it's very, very Peter Pan inspired in that. In that yeah, uh, very, very Peter Pan inspired, sure. Yeah. And then the other is like, you're a, a witch light hand. So it's like you're a carnival hand that works for the carnival and you stick around the carnival. You, you start there, your characters might begin separated uh, at the beginning and then sort of have to come together in the carnival. Um, but again, you, you just really know the carnival. You don't really know the fairy realms that, uh, you know, that it borders on or visits. And so they're really going for like, you know, a, a mix of both. Like you have a connection to the realm of fairy, but you're not like a full on satyr, <laughs> you know, or from yeah. there or something like that. And for me, this is where I, I would highly encourage the group I was writing this for to like, why don't you guys try an all human group like and even try to go low magic because I think it'd be interesting to sort of start in a very low magic human centric world and then step into a world that is not that at all. And for the players to have a very like grounded, uh, I dare I say it, realistic big quotes around this one, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, background where they're just sort of you know, freeholding peasants and, and minor gentry or whatever from this, you know, what your standard low fantasy setting that then get to step into the high magic, uh, whimsical and weird world that is fifth edition, especially as portrayed through uh, this adventure. I think that could be really fun because if you were the kind of like an assortment of, you know, just random PCs, some of the like wonder and strangeness of the place can be diminished if you're like, well, you know, I'm already like, I'm already a satyr, or, or I'm, you know, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lion person from another magic realm. This isn't that weird. Yeah. You know? Um, I think you could highlight it by, by having a grounded beginning, but, uh, that's just me. That's how I do it. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is throughout you will have like chances to basically kind of enter like these like fey packs where you can get yeah. a, like abilities or items or whatever, if you do these certain things, so there yeah. are ways to kind of garner and, and, and collect power in a, yeah. in, in, a, in a slightly different way other than just your standard like character track. Certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it kind of like also connects with the, the race options because we have fairy and then the, uh, what's Haragon, the, the rabbit folk. Her- yeah, and, Haragon, yeah. <laughs> right. And like, I know that there's some contention over fairy because they have a fly speed. Um, I personally, I, I think that that's okay. There's, 
it does like make a lot of lower level challenge physical challenges uh easily handled uh by the flying character there's restrictions mm -hmm. on it uh, and there's more to environmental challenges than just like height differences and difficulty getting places um and so i, I think that it's it's all right it's a shame to see that they they don't have the amorphous quality anymore that they had in the ua <laughs> uh they can cast uh, in large reduce <laughs> on themselves <laughs> yeah i thought that was a, a you know a, a whatever it was a caveat to be like well but you can make yourself tiny personally sure, I'm, sure. A, I'm, I'm not gonna lie jim if you're gonna put fairies in there make them tiny you got a limit yeah, on how much yeah, you can real. carry you still have that fly yeah. speed but you can't yeah, carry go through a lot the, go through yeah go through the effort to just figure it out yeah yeah yeah. you're tiny it's worth it and you can cast in large to make yourself small at least <laughs> but yeah your like, combat form. Uh, yeah uh, but still it's just one of those things of like ah come on you know just yeah, just do it yeah. just do it yeah yeah I, I can see why they they really like the small to medium pcs without having to worry about tiny or large uh so i feel the same uh -huh. with like minotaurs and goliath but uh but oh, yeah, yeah the, no they, they should totally be large <laughs> and centaurs yeah. come on uh -huh. um i don't really the the, the heron uh gone are not uh my cup of tea really uh so i don't really pay much attention to them but they look interesting they, there's certainly a lot of jump. like if they can jump there's a lot of interesting stuff they do with them in, later on in the adventure but what mm -hmm. really caught my eye were the plot hooks and there's two of them there's the lost things plot hook in which you know you visited this carnival you, you snuck in something was taken from you uh and that could be anything from like a favorite toy to your sense of humor you know it's, it, there's a wide range of possibilities and what i liked it is because it gives the player characters motivation for being in the Feywild, wild that they feel mm -hmm. a, a, a draw to this carnival that only shows up every you know once every eight years and and it's back and they want they want to seek out what it is that they lost and they have an intuitive understanding that it's there now when we get to the adventure itself there's some hiccups along the way but having a hook that like gives the player characters motivation to do a thing as opposed to being told to do a thing by an npc i find is so much more powerful it fits with the theme of this being like a fairy tale type adventure of like having lost something as a child, but now you're sort of a young adult seeking it back. Um, it it's, it's provides a, a strong character motivation to navigate this open world, this, this sort of open-ended uh, problem. And I find like the NPC-driven motivation of go to X place, solve X problem, bring this thing back to me, like mm -hmm. doesn't always, doesn't really work <laughs> with an open uh, world because the, you know you've got conflicting signals there the players are like well we have to do this thing the NPC told us we accepted the quest but also there's this wide open world we want to explore which do we do whereas if you if they have their own goal their own goal includes searching out this open world for what they need and and right. I think the lost things is, is superior personally I'd blend both of them you know <laughs> and 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 well yeah I mean who, both of them yeah you know. who's to say the the NPC hiring you hasn't lost something themselves but they just can't come back from for, yeah, yeah. because of some you know esoteric law that they breached or whatever some code of conduct sure, that yeah they, yeah that it banished yeah, them and have, took this thing right right or that you have multiple hooks for the party like if you have an archfey pact warlock the the warlock uh qu warlock quest uh is is perfect for it right like mm -hmm. you're, you haven't heard from your patron right like you yeah. can even skip the npc and just tell that player directly oh yeah you have this patron uh, you haven't heard from them uh, you know one way to get there is through this carnival mm -hmm. you know good luck <laughs> uh and yeah uh you know I, I would use both of them depending on party composition uh definitely I, I i will say this the one way that i would play a harrigan would be a usagi ujimbo type who lost their honor <laughs> and they're yeah. they're they're going to get it back yeah <laughs> yeah that but would be uh, fun. that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh see there's always a way jim there's um, always a way there's always at least one <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so let's let's get into that. Let's get into the the, the um, exploring both the carnival and then you know realizing that it is kind of a a path to the to the Feywild itself, and continuing yeah. the investigation. Like whatever plot hooks you decided to do, there's it, a pretty kind of a, a nice little sandbox, kind of broken up into three parts. Uh, mm -hmm. With mm -hmm. with uh, as they're as they're called hither, tither, and yon. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, these three areas that are all very distinctive terrains and, and types of environment, but oh, yeah. each of them is, is populated by its own little set of circumstances that you get to yeah. 
to make your way through. Yeah, yeah, and and how you navigate through these uh, these different realms, these fragmented uh, uh, domains, um, is really up to the players. There are prompts, you know, they 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 pretty much explicitly tell the DM like, let the players see the the landmarks. You know, they can go where they go, and then what happens along the way is is really entirely in the DM's hands. If they just want them to get there without trouble, they can. If they want there to be random encounters or or you know. The, something that uh you know models the fluctuating uh nature of the feywild because this place responds to like strong expressions of emotion you know like mm -hmm. the, the landscape will change trees will cry or, or things like that um so you have a lot of leeway in how you present this environment uh in terms of pacing and momentum and and keeping your game sort of uh, focused and I really kind of like that. There's a lot of solid advice for new DMs in this book, like advice that really ought to be in the DMG about like how to run combats, how to let players know about AC and hit points and monster abilities. And as you're going through these different realms, there's a lot of things that are like, well, whenever you want to, whenever you think it's appropriate or whenever you think it's interesting, you know, if there's a random table, it's things like you can roll on this or you can just pick one that's appropriate. So in terms of like advice for running them, it's very good. It's also very dense. <laughs> like you, more than other uh, adventures, you really want to read through this one because there's a lot of detail in the paragraph text um, that is pretty necessary to navigating your way through the sandbox because it's following these breadcrumbs and looking for these clues. Like, okay, this NPC needs a favor done. They're, you know, trapped somewhere. I can go to this other location and talk to this other NPC and do something for them that'll get me the thing I need for the first NPC. And then that sends you to a third location <laughs> that you deal with the mm -hmm. problem for the second NPC. And like, it, I can see how at the table, this would make for very engaging player driven style games. But from a DM side, there's a lot to juggle and a lot to keep track of. So it's kind of nice to be able to say like, yeah, we're not worrying about the fluctuating swamp levels <laughs> right now <laughs> you know we've got a lot of other things on our mind uh and it's yeah. okay because this is a fluctuating fairy realm that sometimes it nothing happens you know um you're you're you don't have to get bogged down in the details no pun intended that was jim you take that back that was so intended <laughs> <laughs> right yeah you just don't want to so swap them with puns <laughs> right yeah so yeah the, the the sandbox portion is is fun but it's it it's a different um prep load for the dm whereas if you're used to a more combat heavy game uh or like a dungeon crawl or something you know you want to prep the encounters the stat blocks you know the major npcs that kind of thing whereas this one there's not really an npc that doesn't have something valuable to contribute and mm -hmm. the information that they have and not just from the NPCs, but like the locations that they're at, poking your nose around, asking questions, going places that, you know, you might not, uh, you know, think that you're, you ought to go, but you're not going there to like kill things and take the stuff. You're there to poke your nose around and see what's interesting and what you might be able to find. And like, it's just a different um, mindset that rewards curiosity and players that really like discovering secrets. Um, and that, mm -hmm. like I said, that, that necessitates a different kind of prep load for the DM because they got to keep track of all that information uh, so that it gets to the players. Yeah, most definitely. And uh, if you're looking for a place to uh, reward your curiosity, if you head on over to Patreon, we have a ton of podcasts covering uh, the entire gamut of role playing and, and <laughs> nerdery and everything in between. Uh, so you can go check that out. Uh, give us some support and you get a lot of extra content. So uh check that out for yourself um like you were talking about uh the, there are a ton of npcs mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and and they are meant to be interacted with like oh yeah you know some some of them players are gonna still just kick down the door and want to just draw their sword <laughs> yeah but it does behoove you uh especially with satyrs <laughs> um to actually talk to them and um yes. it, <laughs> sorry um, that's all right, <laughs> but <That's> um, okay. <laughs> but they do give you uh, a lot to help with that. Like especially uh -huh. like I'm thinking of like the the role playing cards like kind of that are provided just to kind of give you you know with that many NPCs 
hey, this is just kind of their general demeanor and how to role play them and you know their their t biffs, their you know traits, bonds, flaws, right, yeah. all that all that fun stuff. Yeah. So at least yeah, they're like helping. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are, and I, I think that there's there are uh, DM aids in here that I think are really great. Um, they're also sort of the the bare minimum of what I would want out of this. And so you're still going to have to like read through the adventure. There's a story tracker to help you keep track of major events uh, that occur along the way. Some of which the players might not be aware that something that happened, almost always a choice they made um, is significant or will pay off later. So finding ways to like make sure when it's the payoff, there's a a way to call back like, Oh, this is because of that thing you did at first level, you know, even though it's the payoff is it to like seventh level or something, for instance. Right. So there's a way to keep track of that and specific call outs in the text that say, okay, mark this down in the story tracker, take it, you know, take a note of this. Uh, it helps you keep track of the locations uh, for certain key items that are randomly generated uh, at the uh, start of the adventure. Um, but like in that sense, that's, that's kind of it. And, and in many ways that's like, explanation of it is m- more than than it uh you know actually provides it's it's like a little checklist basically and then similarly with the npcs we get like full write-ups in the text and there's uh, two appendices that have further write-ups uh for the information which is really valuable it's really going to help you bring these npcs to life keep track of their motivations what they know what they want but at the same time you're gonna have to read through those digest them and then put them in a format that's easy for you to use at the table so that you can remember that without having to go back a lot and be like, Oh yeah, well uh, the NPC would have also told you X, Y, Z. So like the aids are really necessary and I really hope that we see similar things going forward, but you might find that you need more uh, support as you run this adventure because of the sheer number of interesting and engaging and like that's, they just scream, like interact with me, you know, the funny names, puns, memorable uh you know sort of appearances and mannerisms there's not really any stock npcs in the adventure that i've found so far they're all like Mm -hmm. you know inhabitants of fairy with their own stories to tell kind of uh npcs yeah and uh i gotta say i love uh stage frights lines like uh (laughs) (laughs) you should you should just look at it it's it's there's some there's some good ones uh for when you're bombing um <laughs> right right <laughs> there are some fun ones. and like there's just there are there are a lot of just little call outs like that right like there's a bugbear in the carnival that has a, a like a jack-o'-lantern as a helmet which i personally enjoy because i love the pumpkin-headed bugbear from mm-hmm. uh and d's first ever supplement and like that that's sort of like that's my member berry crunch uh for it but there's like callbacks to the 80s cartoon that like I never watched, so they went right over my head. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, there's like some of the action figures that came out: War Duke and uh, Strongheart and Kellek. Uh, there's th- just like a lot of little like touches and and callouts to D and D's lore that like the players might get an enjoyment out of. I don't know how much it comes across like in the adventure itself, but it's similar to like in Icewind Dale, you could. You know, play a character who's a fan of Drist because of the novels, kind of thing. Like, I think it's it's just there to like delight the players, and um, otherwise they're just NPCs. But I kind of like that there's these callouts to uh, to D and D's past in it. Yeah, Daco the clown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nobody nobody you gets know. him. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I feel like nope. I got off track a bit. Um, of a, but like coming back to just talking about the NPCs and like running it, um, the cards are a great addition. The callout notes are are necessary, and and you know while we could quibble about how they're presented, it's it's necessary information to run the adventure. It's worth reading and going through. Um, but other than that, there's not too many new mechanics that I've seen. Like most of the charisma ability checks involved have fairly low DCs. Um, and I haven't really come across, at least in my skim through, of like any new systems or anything that, were, that weren't like specific to, to a, a moment in the adventure, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's not a lot of mechanical heft to it, but all the NPCs want something and are willing to trade information for favors and things like that. So yeah. there's plenty of role-playing meat to, uh, to chew on. 
Yes, the best thing to do is to try to get your players tied up in as a complicated web of favors owed and borrowed as you yeah. can, because yeah, uh, yeah. a very you know. fairy tale adventure. <laughs> yeah, for for any advice on this, just watch the mash episode for want of a boot. Uh, it is exactly mm. what I thought of when I was reading through this. Really? Um, okay. So I, I was thinking of that Deep Space Nine episode where there's supply problems and uh, the uh, if I forget his name. And they have the, self the, seal, the self-sealing stem bolts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the, the, they call it some sort of river, but it's like basically like a river of favors. I'll do a little thing for you. You do a little thing for me. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. That, yeah, seriously, yeah. It's, that, that, it's that model for episode or show. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the like, best thing to do is, is to have it all come tumbling down at the very end. <laughs> uh, and that's the climax yeah. of the episode. <laughs> Absolutely. But like, this is sort of what a social adventure looks like and, and what yeah. Dungeons and Dragons adventures built around social interaction and, and the like look like if you're running sort of like a high society type game where rank and status mattered, where you can't just like throw down at the drop of a hat or drop a fireball on somebody. There's rules and the like, which there are rules in fairy about ownership and hospitality and reciprocity. Like that's what it looks like. And so the game is for the players to figure that out, to, to approach each interaction with an NPC from the point of view of like, what do they have that my character wants? And how can I get it from them in, in the way that they give it to me willingly? Like, mm -hmm. that's the challenge. It's not about, like, can I, my hit points outlast their attack bonus, you know, or, or is my AC high enough? It's, like, as a player, am I taking notes about who's who? What do they want? What favors? Who, who owes me a favor? Who do I owe favors to? You know, what are the big mysteries uh, of the adventure? There's a lot of them. And there's a satisfying payoff at the end in the, the palace of, uh, I forget what the full title is, but the, the fairy palace at the end, right? Like, palace it's hearts very desire. satisfying. Hearts desire. Yeah. Hearts desire, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's worth the effort to go through that, but it's a different kind of D&D. &D. It's still D&D. &D. Like, there's fights. You can fight. There's fights that you don't mm -hmm. want to get into. You could that you could have TPKs of because they're uh, really deadly uh, for the level you would encounter them. So it's still Dungeons and Dragons, but it's a Dungeons and Dragons that acknowledges the full horizon of D and D's play experience, which is that sometimes you're just talking to NPCs and trading favors, and when mm -hmm. that naturally leads to armed conflict, then it naturally leads to it, and you have satisfying stakes that arose organically out of the adventure, as opposed to perfunctory combat because we got to burn through six encounters between long rests. You know? Yeah, we want to level and, up, uh, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, like, and the milestone leveling in Wildmount is still based on player accomplishment and goals. So it's not arbitrary. It's not just because we started a new chapter. It's when they encounter this creature, when they travel to this new realm, like that's when they gain a level. So I, th I think like it's very different, but I, I think it's when you put in the work to like put it all together, and make it work for your group, it'd be very satisfying. It's a lot of promise. Yeah, most most definitely. So uh, do you have any just final thoughts there uh, uh, on the adventure as a whole? Because I think we both think it's come across pretty clear, like both kind of like this adventure. Um, I really yeah, want to yeah. run it. You know, that's 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 a absolute thing that I want to happen. And at some point, so yeah, <laughs> obviously it succeeded. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a fresh look, you know, fifth edition's getting long in the tooth. There's been a lot of examples of more combat heavy campaigns. There is space in the D and D world for non-combat social centered adventures. And I think that this is a really good way of framing that it's interesting. It's magical. It still reads as D and D. You're still dealing with D&D monsters solving D&D, you know, related problems. And, like, you, you can still have a satisfying amount of combat as well. You just can't cut your way through it. And that's okay. That's all right. And if it gets groups to sort of start l looking at D&D as something more than a combat engine where you fight monsters and get treasure, then that's a good thing because it expands the game for all of us and all fans of D&D benefit from the game being more expansive and accommodating more play styles. And I really like that. I'm really encouraged to see it. Um, in terms of DM aids and like where to go from here, something like a relationship map that's a pictorial example of who the major NPCs are, 
what their relationship to each other is and where the conflict lies would be really helpful. And then like for me, uh, <laughs> where I would go is like starting to combine maps and information into one step so that when you're a DM, for instance, looking at the carnival, uh, you can look at the information as it's arranged in the way that the players will encounter it instead of having to flip pages back and forth. Um, but that's really a, a minor thing that uh, if you have access to the digital files, you can just you know use a snip tool and snip screenshots mm -hmm. and put them on the big map for yourself. Yeah, most definitely. But uh, all in all, it's a high, uh, I think we highly recommend it. Um, you should check yeah. it out. Yeah. And... Uh, Make sure to check out that subscribe button. See how you're dealing with that and the like. Uh, throw a comment in there. Tell us what you think. If you've already uh, looked through the book uh, and you agree or you vehemently disagree, then uh, we can do that too and we'll throw down gauntlets and all that fun stuff and, you know, according to the <laughs> rules of reciprocity. <laughs> but uh, we'll see you next week. So, Jim, you ever just sit around and think about the future? Yeah, yeah, certainly. You're talking about D&D's future? Well, I mean, Ovs. Like, <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah. this, is, uh, this is one of those uh, moments where we're recording, like, right after some big D&D news. So, yeah, like, I, I'm still, yeah. like, piecing through, like, what all they've announced this week at the the D&D &D celebration. But, um the future of D and D has some interesting, like it's got some, it's gotten my thoughts churning because it's like pretty explicit. It's not a new edition, but something new is coming. Something, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know. It's just like, it, it feels like that, that things with fifth edition have just had happened at this glacial pace that looking at like 2024 is like that. That's so far from now. <laughs> It's like another two years, but yeah, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, it'll be here before you know it, though. I mean, we're almost yeah. at 22, so... That's true. You know, that is true. You know, like, yeah, like sands through the hourglass. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, they're saying it's going to be... Um, uh, new core books will be backwards compatible uh, with existing 5th edition books, um, and that's a new evolution of the game. And, like, I, I would be surprised if they go with, like, a 0.5 version like you know what i mean like do they want to risk an edition war or something like that I, I don't know whether that would happen again is anybody's guess I don't, it's not inevitable um uh, but i yeah, can see them I, wanting to update 5e what, what you got oh no i i just i was gonna kind of piggyback on that point of like i think it'll basically be a 0.5 without calling it a 0.5 oh sure because yeah. i mean if you're evolving the rules but it's still backwards compatible like that's all three five was is they changed some <laughs> rules to try to make the game more playable, but it was basically the same game. So, right. <laughs> but they don't want to do something that's already been done. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they have marketing teams that have gone through it all, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. That they, they got a whole plan for it, but like uh, just like an update to five, e is sorely needed. Like it's, it's, it's okay. You know? Mm -hmm. Games games pretty old, <laughs> uh, and yeah. there's been a lot of development in in uh, in it over the years. <laughs> yeah, and they and they've been s doing surveys left and right, and that's one thing that they 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 kind of harped on is the fact that they are taking those to heart. Mm. So hopefully, you know, they do. But again, pe different people have different ideas about what D and D should be. So trying to please everyone can sometimes be not a good thing. Like trying to please sure, too many yeah. people can, I don't, I don't know the right word for it, but homogenize. No, maybe. Sure, yeah. It can make it very, it can make for like an unfocused, uh, sort of yeah. thing. I, I'm not sure that like appealed to, to all potential players of D and D. Like, I don't even think fifth edition currently is trying to do that, but I, I think like broadening the appeal, especially like the perception of what D and D could be will probably be yeah. part of it. Right. And, and, and to me, it's like the, the big deal. D and D is a, a game that can do a lot of things. It just is. Yeah. The perception seems to be otherwise. And I think maybe that's where this evolution will go as well as like cleaning things up and updating things. And, you know, like players handbook subclasses could all use a fresh coat of paint, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it, it, definitely. And just, uh, kind of exp 
you know, like, I mean, we harp on this all the time, but expanding, like, the exploration and social rules could do the game a huge service. Because mm-hmm. giving mm-hmm. as explicit a sets of rules as combat has and the, and the, the, the support in both, you know, player options, DM advice... Uh, and even sure. just monstrous uh, monster options, like making mm-hmm. more monsters. Like you want to talk to more monsters before just killing them because you can find out things that are important, <laughs> especially when those monsters can speak, you know, common or, you know, you have a similar language yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah I, yeah. I think that that expanding those rules can only benefit the game. Just give people more options on how to play the game and you can have more mm-hmm. people that want to play the game. Yeah, yeah. Like, in many ways, these things already are in 5th edition, but they're scattered throughout the adventures and the supplements, and, and they're all over the place. Like, you know, what what I think is really needed for a lot of this, especially the sort of rule support that you're talking about, is a redesign of the DMG with a pivot away from as, as many page uh, you know pages devoted to, like, world building and pare mm-hmm. that down and put more, like, running the game, uh, handling certain situations, because like having something that is is, as explicit as combat to fall back on can be useful in situations like wouldn't want something that like is restrictive or or binding in that sense that people feel like they can't get creative in their role playing or something but Mm -hmm. when you don't know what to do having something to fall back on is helpful and those things are already in 5e they're just not integrated into the adventures they're sort of hidden um, I really do think there was a stronger version when 5e came out of avoiding that kind of prescriptiveness in the rules that third edition and fourth edition had, where it was very much like, this is what you do. This is how it works. Oh, you got a 25, then this always happens. You know, like dip- diplomats are kind of <laughs> uh, builds that you could get. And I, yeah. I think there's a space in the middle that says like something more than just make it up and some vague guidelines and like, the other very restrictive like concrete procedural system uh, and striking a happy middle seems to be what 5e is going for i'm looking forward to seeing what they'll do and how they'll uh, mm-hmm. update things yeah and then uh, the other thing was the what is it the 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 gift pack uh, yeah. uh that's going to be coming out early next year that has a uh, uh the the kasha tasha's cauldron of uh-huh. secrets it's got or everything whatever works. Yeah, the two everything books. That's the only thing I really remember. And then the uh, Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse, which that's how you jump on that uh, that uh, contemporary uh, branding. Uh, yeah. Multiverse is hot right now in uh, pop culture. Hot, yeah, yeah, and D and D had one a long time ago, so <laughs> might as well just get that alliteration and that uh, that multiversal madness that is already out there mm-hmm. permeating uh-huh. and just. <laughs> Just grab on. Listen, a book that like updates monsters and gives and gives monsters some love. Uh, I I love those, right? Like, and it's really been I think since Volos that there's been like a you know dedicated monster book. I know that there's player stuff in it too. It's rules expansion, so there's something for everybody. But one that is like focused on monsters. I'm kind of curious about. Nice to see Morden kind of get in the second uh, title in the edition. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's maybe, been around for a while, so <laughs> right. And maybe I'll bring his material plane into uh, physical existence on this one, but um, yeah, that would be. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. That's gonna be cool. I I like the last box set they did. I think the covers look really cool, and it's nice to have the the three core books like in the slipcase, and this one looks really neat too. Um, and yeah, like D and D as an evolution of a game set, I think is an idea to embrace. Because if it stays the same, if if it if it's always this thing grants advantage, and you know this, you know we never grow the game, not just mechanically, but in terms of like how it's presented, and and how the various adventures you can have with it are presented, then you're just going to get a stagnant game, and like yeah. you can already see it, you can't go online most places and mention D and D without like having a chorus of people talk about other games you should play, and it's like. Yeah, thank you. We know about those games exist. So many of them are quite enjoyable. D and D is also a game to enjoy, and it it can be a lot of things. And so I think like embracing that attitude uh, is is a way to like grow and stay relevant and keep the game vital. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Uh, 